In the last lecture, we had taken a look at the way in which a PN junction diode is constructed and the way in which it works. Admittedly, we did that in a sort of hand-waving, not too rigorous way, but we did capture the essence of the way in which a diode works. We are going to take that forward in this lecture and talk about how to use this knowledge in understanding how a diode can be used in a circuit. So first, let me remind you about the diode characteristics, which is nothing but the current which flows through a diode as a function of the voltage across it. Now, you all know that this is the symbol of a diode, the one on the left here, and the significance of the symbol is that it is an arrow. It says that the current only flows from one direction. So here, this is the P side of the diode. This signifies, the bar signifies the N side and current only flows from P to N and not from N to P. At least, as you already see, there is a current which flows from N to P, but that's very, very tiny. Now, in the last lecture, we have seen that the current density in a diode is made out of two pieces, a diffusion current and a drift current. The diffusion current depends exponentially on the voltage applied to the diode, whereas the drift current is more or less the same irrespective of what the voltage is. And if you put the two together, you get an expression for the current density in a diode as a, as a function of the voltage across it. This leads rather simply uh, to the current expression given by this. So this is the IV relation for a diode. It can be approximated by this expression ID equals IS e to the power VD by eta VT minus 1. Now these symbols may be slightly new to you, so they do require some explanation. This parameter eta is here to actually signify the fact that the model that we talked about in the last video may not be an exact description of the processes that takes place in a diode. Uh, well, the description that we used in the last lecture fits germanium diodes rather well, which is why the germanium expression that we have for the ID versus VD expression for a germanium diode actually fits this expression pretty well with eta equals 1. So this is typically a, the curve which you get. Of course, there's a curve in the negative direction as well, but th since the current in the negative direction is so small, it's essentially coinciding with the axis, so we can't see it distinctly. Now, as I said, the parameter eta is material dependent. In germanium, our description Work fine, so eta can be put equal to 1. Whereas for silicon, the actual physical process which dominates is not the one we described. There are other more complicated processes which take place and which actually contribute more to the behavior of a diode. And in silicon, you can still model the current versus voltage relationship with a similar relationship, except that the parameter eta has to change to 2. That also means that for the same amount of voltage, uh, the current in silicon is actually less. So you need to go to higher voltages in a silicon diode to get the same effect as in a germanium diode. Now, what happens when you put in a reverse bias? Of course, when you make VD negative, this exponential becomes less than 1 and if you make VD a large negative value, large compared to this VT parameter sitting here, this is nearly 0, so ID becomes minus IS for large negative voltages and we will soon see what large negative voltages mean here, how large is large. ID goes to a value which is minus IS, so the magnitude of the reverse saturation current is given by IS, that is the when you go to the go to when you reverse bias a diode, what is the largest current that you can get? As we expected, this is pretty tiny. In fact, in this graph, we have deliberately blown up the scale in the negative direction so that you can actually see the current here. So the, this is not drawn to scale. If I had drawn the positive current in the positive quadrant on the same scale, it would have blown off almost immediately out of the range of this graph. 
Now, what is this parameter Vt? After all, remember we had a temperature dependent factor in the diffusion current because of the exponential dependence of the, of the diffusion on temperature. And Vt is exactly that. Vt is nearly nothing, is nothing but the temperature in thermal units. Uh, so, what you are doing is using the fact that Kb, the Boltzmann constant, converts the temperature into energy and you divide that by the charge of the electron or the magnitude of the charge of the electron, you end up with a voltage. So, basically what you have done is, uh, well, this is wrong. You're, it's not temperature in thermal units. That's That would have been Kelvin. It's temperature in voltage units. So, Vt is temperature expressed as a voltage. Uh, Kvt by Q. And if you put in the values of Kb and Q, this is a rather nice equation which comes out. Vt is nothing but the temperature in Kelvin divided by 11,600 in terms of volts. And if you use a room temperature, this comes out to be around 25 to 26 millivolts. Of course, uh, that depends on where you are placed in the world. In tropical countries like us, it's around 26 millivolts. So, the room temperature value of Vt is 26 millivolts. So, when I said large negative voltages for Vd, I meant much bigger than 26 millivolts. Realize that 26 millivolts is a pretty tiny voltage. So, any reasonable negative voltage essentially drives the diode to its reverse saturation current value, which is very, very tiny. However, this is going to be very important later. This reverse saturation current is strongly temperature dependent. Why? Because it's primarily due to the minority carriers which are created in the depletion region and those are pulled across the junction by the field produced in the depletion region. If you remember what I talked about in the last video. So, IS of course depends strongly on the number of intrinsic charge carriers produced in where it depends on this quantity N0 square and which actually depends very strongly on the temperature. The TQ factor in front is really not the major part of the temperature dependence. The major part of the temperature dependence comes from this exponential factor where T is sitting in the denominator. Large T means very small value for this negative denominator. So, of course, larger the T is, the smaller the negative value is. So, the N0 square keeps on growing rather rapidly, the temperature much more rapidly than the T cube factor would predict. In addition to the N0 square, which is of course related to, related to the concentration of holes and electrons produced by, uh, or at least the minority carriers produced in the depletion region. In addition to that, another important factor is how fast the holes and electrons diffuse. And that actually depends on the material. So, Strictly speaking, the overall temperature dependence of a silicon diode and a germanium diode is slightly different. But without going into the nitty gritties of the de of details here, we can talk about rule of the thumb. It's a pretty reasonable rule of the thumb to say that this current, this reverse saturation current, doubles for every 10 degree rise in temperature. So the value it has at room temperature, say. 30 degrees doubles when you reach 40 degrees. And this very sharp dependence of the reverse saturation current on temperature is important for several reasons. One of them is that it gives you a very sensitive temperature probe. It allows you to measure temperature very precisely because this quantity depends so drastically on temperature. So that's a good side of this temperature dependence. You can use this as a thermometer. And in fact, it is used as a thermometer often. On the other hand, this extreme dependence of this on temperature has its dark side. Sometimes it messes up the, the operation of a PN junction diode or other semiconductor devices pretty badly. And we will come to this topic in a video which is to come very soon. But basically you should realize that there is a problem here that if you raise temperature, the reverse saturation current increases and increasing current in any case produces more heat. So unless that heat can be dissipated away, that can cause further range, rise in temperature causing the whole thing to spiral out of control. So there is this one issue we have to be wary about.
Now, ordinary resistances, things which you have been used to so far, are ohmic conductors. They have a linear or a straight line IV graph, I is proportional to V, whereas as you can see, the diode characteristics, the I versus V graph for a diode, are strongly nonlinear. The blue line here, the blue curve is a diode characteristic, which of course is very far away from a straight line, and the red line that I've drawn here is that of a diode, of a raised. So a diode is a blue line, a raised would be the red line, and their characteristics are very, very different. So does it at all make sense to talk about the resistance of a diode? Well, sometimes we can just do this. We can just take the voltage across the diode, divided by the current through the diode, and I get a quantity which I call the diode resistance, V by I. This, of course, is nothing but the slope of this line which joins the origin of the IV characteristics to the point where you are right now. Of course, unlike in resistance, where the V by I ratio should be a constant, no matter what your V or I is, this RD is very strongly dependent on where on the characteristic curve you are. Now, this is called the DC or static diode resistance. Total voltage divided by total current, not really a very useful quantity. A much more useful quantity, especially for small signal analysis, also for understanding the effective equivalent circuit of the diode, which we will introduce in this lecture, is so-called AC or dynamic diode resistance. Well, as opposed to the line joining the origin to this point on the IV characteristics, which of course signifies the present value of the current and the voltage which you are using, you can approximate this curve, even though it's a curve line, much better by a straight line by considering not this line, of course, but the tangent. So if you draw the tangent to the IV characteristics at your current operating point and take the slope of the tangent, that gives rise to what is called the AC resistance or the dynamic diode resistance. Well, I say slope, but you have to remember that this is an I versus V graph, not a V versus I graph. So, strictly speaking, it's a reciprocal of the slope on this curve. So, the dynamic diode resistance is defined by this quantity, R, small rd, not as a notation, capital R, capital D is a static value, and dynamic value, small rd, is actually nothing but the derivative of the voltage with respect to I, but it's also the slope of the tangent, delta V over delta I, inverse slope of the tangent, to be more precise. Now, starting from the diode equation that we wrote down, Id is Is e to the power Vd by eta Vt minus 1, we can find a rather simple expression for this small rd. When we are looking at, at a situation where current is flowing in the diode, that is, we are forward by as a diode, Vd is positive, and given a reasonable amount of forward bias, Remember, Vt is very, very tiny. It's 26 millivolts at room temperature. So even a even half a volt for Vd is very, very much bigger than eta Vt. So this exponential is very large. So what you can do is approximate Id by Id equals Is exponential Vd by eta Vt. Of course, this makes life very easy for us. After all, since we are going to differentiate soon, what is the easier function to differentiate than exponential. Now we can take one more step before we carry out the derivative, which is take the logarithm of both sides. So of course you get log id is log is plus a very simple function vd by eta vt and then carry out the differentiation of both sides with respect to id and this side of course gives you 1 over id, this gives you 0 and this apart from the 1 by eta vt factor gives you exactly the derivative that you're looking for, small rd. So just changing size gives you what small rd is. Small rd comes out to be eta vt by id. And you can, of course, uh, substitute back the expression for vt is kvt by q. So you can see that rd works out to be eta kvt by q id. What is going to be more useful for us 
is the standard result that at room temperature Vt is around 26 millivolts. So this expression really is, apart from the factor of eta, is just 26 millivolts by Id. Now let me remind you that in a electronic circuit, the typical current is not of the order of amperes, it's merely of the order of milliamperes. At the same time, resistances, despite what you might think by looking at the problem sheets that I have sent you so far, are typically not of the order of ohms. The typical resistances, especially in electronic circuits, is more commonly of the order of kilo ohms or even mega ohms. So, if you think of, a, of the current being somewhere in the mid region 2 to 3 milliamperes, 26 millivolts divided by that works out to be around 10 ohms, which really is tiny compared to a kilo ohm or more resistance which the circuit will have. Which is why we say that in the forward direction, a diode has no resistance whatsoever. Well, strictly speaking, it does have a tiny bit of resistance, but in most cases we can safely ignore it. So now that we understand the diode characteristic curve and various parameters associated with it, let us see how we can use this to analyze a diode circuit, a very simple diode circuit. Now the circuit we are going to analyze is a very, very simple circuit. It's simply a diode in series with a resistance placed across a voltage source. And what we want to do is determine as a function of this Vs and of course also RL, how much is the voltage across the diode and how much is the current flowing through the circuit, ID and VD. Now for this, of course, we need relationships which connect ID and VD. And because ID and VD are our two unknowns, we need two relations connecting them. One of them is straightforward. One of them is simply the diode characteristics itself. This curve actually signifies the relationship between ID and VD. We need one more relationship between ID and VD before we can determine them. And the other relationship follows simply from the Kirchhoff voltage law. If you apply KVL to this loop, you simply get Vs, the source voltage, must be equal to the voltage drop across a diode, Vd, plus the voltage drop across the resistance, Id, Rl. So this is the equation that follows, and this is the other relationship between Vd and Id that I was talking about. So here we have two relations. One expresses a graph here the other in a simple algebraic fashion here. So how do we solve them to get Vd and Id? One option would be to actually rewrite this characteristic curve in the form of an equation. We have already seen that, right? We wrote down the equation Id equals Is e to the power Vd by eta, k, eta Vt minus 1. We could use that or use a use an even more precise or more realistic equation describing the particular diode we are using and then solve that equation simultaneously with this one. So while this is a simple linear equation between Vd and Id, the diode characteristic curve leads to a rather complicated nonlinear equation. So we have to solve a nonlinear equation simultaneously with a linear equation. And while an analytic solution would typically not be possible, it's easy to find out a solution by using numerical methods. Maybe bisection, maybe Newton-Raphson, or any of the numerical methods for solving equations that you had learned in previous semesters can be brought to bear here. So you could use them, find out IDVD for a particular value of Vs, could perhaps even change Vs and find out how ID changes as you change Vs, all through standard numerical algorithms. Now, while you can do that, and in fact, we will insist that you actually do that, there is a better or more visual way of getting the answer. And that is to convert this thing from an algebraic equation into a graph. Of course, the graph of this is a very simple thing. It's a straight line equation. So when uh, ID is 0, Vd will come out to be, turn out to be Vs. So the intercept of the straight line with the V axis is simply Vs. 
whereas the intercept with the i axis can be found out just by putting vd equal to 0 and working out that in under that condition id is vs by rl. So if you want to solve them simultaneously, one option would be to change the KVL equation to this graph, a graph which is a straight line going from the point Vs, comma 0 on the v-axis to 0, comma Vs by RL on the i-axis. And this line is called the load line. And the name load line comes in because it depends strongly, the slope of the curve at least depends strongly on RL, the load resistance. Now, where the load line intersects the diode characteristic curve, that gives us the value of ID and VD. So, if you just can draw the load line on the characteristic curve, the intersection will tell you what the current and the voltage voltages are, and you are done. So, let us try to investigate what happens if we were to change the parameters of the circuit. For example, you can see here, the slope of the straight line is given by RL. It's actually negative of the slope is given by RL. Uh, the, the bigger the RL, strictly speaking, the slope is minus 1 by RL. So, bigger the, uh, bigger the RL, flatter the curve. And so, if I changed RL without changing Vs, so if we made this resistance a variable resistance, then as I change the value of RL, this intercept of the straight line, of the load line will stay the same but the slope will keep on changing. So, let us see what that will do to my IDVD values. So, this is for a rather big value of RL. So, for a large RL, this is a rather flat curve and you have a very small current which is sort of expected with a large RL. And as you make RL smaller and smaller, sorry I was going the wrong way, if you make RL smaller and smaller, ID rises and the way the ID rises can be figured out by the point of intersection, the way the point of intersection moves here. So, changing RL changes the slope of the load line, changes the intersection point and changes ID versus VD, I, both ID and VD values. What is perhaps more interesting for us is what happens if I were to change Vs. Notice that the slope of the straight line depends only on the value of the load resistance, it is minus 1 by RL. So, if I keep the load resistance fixed, change Vs, I will get distinct load lines, but these load lines will all be parallel to each other. So, if I change Vs, it shifts the load line parallel to itself. Now, in this graph, what I have done is, in addition to finding out the IDVD point by the intersection of the load line with the diode characteristic curve, which is the green circle here, I have also plotted a black circle, which is the simply the value of the current against the source voltage. So, this point has coordinates Vs, comma Id. As I change Vs, the load line shifts parallel to itself and the Vs, comma Id points, of course, same Id, so the same horizontal line, but right above Vs, gives me another point. And by keeping on changing Vs, I can keep on building up more and more points in the Vs versus Id graph. So, the Vs versus Id curve can be found out from the Vd versus Id graph, which is, uh, which was called, the, which is called the static characteristic, characteristics of the diode. The Vs versus Id graph, on the other hand, is called the dynamic characteristics. Uh, the reason why this is called the dynamic characteristics is really that the dynamics of a system, the way in which changing the input voltage changes the current and the behavior of the circuit, that's signified more clearly by this graph, the Vs versus Id curve. So, the blue curve is a static characteristic curve. This relates only to the diode is the current through the diode versus the voltage across the diode. This curve, of course, does not depend on what else is connected to the diode. Whereas, Vs versus Id curve of course, depends not only on the diode, but also on the resistance connected to the diode. So, the reason why we pay more attention to static characteristics, despite the fact that the dynamic characteristics can be, easier to, can be a simpler tool to use when you want to predict current versus input voltage, is simply that the dynamic characteristics will also depend on the load resistance used. Change the load resistance, you have to use a different dynamic characteristics.
But the nature of the dynamic characteristic curve is also rather easy to understand. It is a nonlinear curve, of course, because it ultimately is, is derived from the nonlinear behavior of the diode. However, as you can see here, uh, the the curve really becomes straight once you go to large Vs values. And why is that? Simply because the voltage across the diode hardly increases very much. Not because the voltage across the diode is not an important quantity. It is the controlling property of a diode. But it does the controlling so well. A very small increase in voltage is all you need to drive the current up a huge amount the voltage hardly gets a chance to change very much once it has been established. So, for large Vs values, it's like a nearly constant voltage across a diode plus IDRL, which of course is the equation for a straight line. So, although the curve is curved at the beginning, it sort of straightens out as you go further. We will next use a dynamic characteristic curve of a diode to understand the behavior of the same circuit, but when instead of using a battery or a variable battery here, we use a sinusoidal voltage source. So, let's take a look at that now. So, the circuit that we want to analyze is here in the green box down below. The same circuit as the one we have been talking about so far, a diode in series with a resistance, but the voltage source here is as indicated, a sinusoidal voltage source. And up here in the corner, we have the characteristic curves for the diode, the ID versus VD curve in blue, the static characteristic curve, and the dynamic one in black. And before we go any further, let me also point out that despite the fact that the dynamic characteristic curve is what is uh, going to be very useful in analyzing the circuit and all diode circuits, if you want to do a graphical analysis, it is actually a static characteristic curve which is commonly found. The reason for that is simple. The static characteristic curve depends on the diode. It's a feature or a property of the diode in particular. So when a manufacturer manufactures a diode, what uh, he does is it, he tests a batch of identically prepared diodes, a set of them, determines an average static characteristic curve from the data taken from a bunch of them. And since all the diodes were made identically, uh, this is given to you as a user as the static characteristic curve for the diode. The dynamic characteristic on the other hand depends not only on the diode but also on what resistance you are going to connect across it. So this is specific to the circuit, not just to the diode. This is why uh, a manufacturer data sheet, for example, would usually have, a st have the static characteristics and either not have a dynamic characteristic at all, or if it does have a dynamic characteristic, it will be for a specific load resistance, which may or may not match the load resistance that you are using. Be that as it may, here we are assuming that we have already constructed the dynamic characteristic curve, the curve in black, uh, for this particular load resistance that we are using. And we are going to use this to analyze the behavior of the output of the circuit uh, as the input changes. Here, out by the output, I mean the current through the diode, or I could equally well use this to signify the voltage across the resistance RL, because that, of course, is proportional to this current. Now, can, and you can also see we have drawn a few other axes on this particular diagram and they are drawn in a slightly crazy fashion. Here you see the time axis going downwards here and an identical time axis going over away to the left on this side. These are axes along which the input and the output variation of time will be plotted. The way this is aligned of course is as the input voltage varies and you have a, you plot a graph of VI versus T, the VI variation will be along this axis, which of course is drawn in parallel to the voltage axis. And from the voltage values, we will be able to read off the corresponding current values across a diode, which will be, will be plotted in this graph. 
So I hope there will be no confusion in understanding what these graphs mean when I start showing you how the graphs are plotted. So let's start now. This, let's say, is the initial value of the voltage. And if you see that for this voltage, the corresponding current value is, of course, zero. And this is what ID is at this point. And before I go any further, let me remind you that the black curve actually extends to the negative side as well. Where it's, it represents a reverse saturation current, which in this scale is almost indistinguishable from zero. So now let us start time. So the as, as time goes by, of course, Vi versus T graph will be plotted here. That will be a sinusoid. And we will see what happens to the current versus T here. So, so as time goes by, my input voltage is changing and I can see how the output current is responding in the purple curve over there. Now my input voltage has gone negative and the dynamical characteristics here, of course, I follow the flat line and as a result, the current is also zero, is zero throughout, and then it starts climbing up again. And when you complete another half cycle, the current again returns back to zero. So this is the way in which the output current responds to variations in the input voltage. And if you want to see the, this graphically as a solid graph, this is basically the input voltage variation drawn here in green. And the purple curve here is the output current variation. Or if you just multiplied this by RL, you would get an identically shaped curve which talks about the output voltage or rather it's variation, of variation with time. So as you can see, the output voltage or the current here essentially provides a sort of chopped off view of the input voltage. The input voltage, of course, is in pure sinusoidal AC. It goes both positive and negative as time goes by. The output voltage essentially chops off the negative part and almost gives you a replica of the positive part of the input voltage. But as you can see near the beginning and the end where the voltage starts to climb or here the current starts to climb, there is a small flattening a slight distortion which is caused by the fact that the diode characteristics is not really on and off. It's not exactly the same as the myth that we use that the diode only conducts without any resistance in the forward direction, without any effect in the forward direction and does not conduct at all in the reverse direction. That's really not exactly correct and the difference can be seen if you look very carefully at what is happening when the current is just falling off to zero or when it's just starting to climb from zero. But this analysis is something you can carry out if you just have the dynamic curve, characteristic curve drawn for you. So this is how you go about analyzing a diode circuit graphically. As you may all agree that while this is rather nice to look at, it may not exactly be a very convenient thing to do. But can we understand the behavior at least reasonably well with some simple effective circuits? That is our next topic. Can we think of effective circuits or equivalent circuits for a real diode? Well, let us go back to the diode characteristic curve. The curve in blue is a static characteristic curve ID versus VD for a real diode. And the diode here in blue is the diode symbol here sim symbolizes a real diode. What I've done here is plotted a typical operating point around which the current and voltage of the diode is going to fluctuate. And I've also drawn the tangent to the diode characteristic curve at that particular point. That's the line in red. Question is, can we approximate this behavior the behavior which is actually embodied by this characteristic curve by a simpler set of circuit, circuit elements. Well, first let's try to think about how we can approximate the characteristic curve itself. Of course, it's a curved quantity, curved entity, and it's 
much easier to deal with straight lines than curves. So we can think of approximating this curve part by the 2p straight line. This part by the tangent and this flat part by a straight line segment which is exactly 0. So in this approximation, the direct characteristic curve can be replaced by this red line here which is 0 until a particular voltage V gamma is reached. This gamma is called the cut in voltage, the voltage at which the current starts cutting in. And after that you have a nearly vertical but slightly sloped line. Remember the slope of this line is reciprocal of uh, the diode dynamic resistance which is pretty small so this curve is nearly vertical. Well at the next stage of approximation we can just ignore the fact that this rising line is not really vertical. We can approximate it by this. So what this tells you is that if the diode had the red line as its actual characteristic curve then the voltage, uh, as the voltage increases as long as it is less than V gamma the voltage across the diode is less than V gamma there will be no current once Vd reaches V gamma it does not change from that point any longer uh, the current doesn't really shoot up to infinity but the current can take any value it can depending on the other circuit elements connected but the voltage will not change from V gamma here of course at the previous stage, a slightly more realistic approximation that we had here, the voltage stayed nearly V gamma but not exactly V gamma. It rose a bit as current increased. And then finally we come to, the, to an even simpler approximation where we can just ignore the V gamma. This V gamma is typically rather small value for a germanium diode is around 0.7 or so, for silicon is around 1 or slightly more in volts. Um, if your input voltages typically have amplitudes of the order of tens of volts, then V gamma can be safely ignored. And if you do that, what you get is this characteristic curve. Instead of the blue line, you are approximating the diode by this line, which is no current whatsoever if the voltage across the diode is negative. And if the voltage across the diode is positive, then its only possible value is zero. There is no drop across the diode but uh, the current can be arbitrary. Not necessarily arbitrarily large, but arbitrary. The current will depend on what else is connected to the circuit. Now let us try to think of the successive stages of approximations and use them to build up an effective equivalent circuit for the diode, for the true diode, which is in blue here. So what I will do is I will first approximate the real diode by this, which is an ideal diode, a diode which conducts without any resistance in the forward direction and does not conduct at all in the reverse direction. Unfortunately, there is no circuit symbol available which distinguishes between the ideal diode and the real diode. So I have adopted a convention for this lecture at least. Uh, a diode in red will be an ideal diode. So uh, if I mean an ideal diode, I will draw the diode symbol in red. The blue diode here is a real one. So the zeroth level approximation, okay, uh, strictly speaking, this is the first approximation, there is a second, there is a third, but if you look from the ideal side, this is the zeroth level approximation, that of an ideal diode. So you can approximate your real diode with this one. Well, this is not too good. This one definitely is better as an approximate to the actual diode. And it's very easy to ensure that an ideal diode circuit will behave this way. All you have to do is provide it with a battery or inbuilt voltage source which opposes VD. So that, so if we have a so voltage source along with my ideal diode and this voltage source has a magnitude V gamma in the opposite direction, opposing the Vd, then only when Vd exceeds V gamma can you get current. So, or only when Vd reaches V gamma can you get current. So, this is the one at level approximate. So, this was a zero at level, just the ideal diode. 
The next approximation is the ideal diode in series with an opposing voltage source V gamma so that any forward biasing source which will be positive on the upper end negative on the lower end so that it tries to drive current in the right direction through the diode uh, will be opposed by V gamma and until the source reaches V gamma there will be no current. Now of course here the characteristic for this circuit will be until V gamma no current whatsoever and after V gamma any current without any change in the voltage. The voltage will simply be V gamma because there will be no drop across the diode. Now comes the final approximation which is straight line until you hit V gamma then it's then not a vertical line but a slightly slope line. So how can you get a slightly slope line? This means of course that once the diode starts to conduct there will be some voltage drop across the diode which is proportional to the amount of current which is flowing through it and that's obviously easy to implement all you need is a series resistance and that's it and this series resistance as can be identified very easily is nothing but a diode dynamical resistance remember the quantity that we calculated to be eta 26 millivolts by id here of course the id is nothing but the operating current so the current at which you have drawn the tangent here so this is the diode equivalent circuit this is not exactly the same as the real diode the real diode of course has this blue line as a characteristic curve but i'm pretty sure you will agree that for most part this two piece straight line is a pretty good approximate to the real diode behavior so we will often use this in analyzing a circuit which really has a proper real diode. Well, as I said, small rd typically has a value of around 10 ohms or so, and if the resistances that are already present in the circuit are of kilo ohm order, then a resistance of 10 ohms or so, of course, doesn't really make much, much of a difference. So we can safely ignore that. So in such situations, we can even use this an opposing V gamma in series with an ideal diode as the approximation. And finally, if the input voltage that we are using is much larger than V gamma, which is typically of the order of a volt or less, we can safely approximate the real diode with the completely ideal diode. So this is starting from the ideal real diode, these are three different stages of approximation. This is the closest, but the most complicated, of course. This is simpler, almost good enough, as long as small rd is much smaller than the resistances in the circuit. And even this is good enough for many purposes. Not when your input voltage is as small as 2 or 3 volts, then of course V gamma is substantial, then you will, be, you will be better off using this one. So as an example of using these approximate or equivalent diode circuits to analyze the circuit, let us go back and take a look at the same circuit as before. This is the one which we solved using the dynamical characteristic curve a while ago. Here, we can of course analyze the circuit either graphically, that we did, numerically, which is by solving the equations using a computer perhaps, or by using the diode equivalent circuit, which is what we are going to do now. So, what we are going to do is replace this diode, the real diode, the one in blue, with an ideal diode in series with a opposing voltage V gamma and small rd. So, this is the full diode effective equivalent circuit that we have put in here. Just to remind you once again, the red diode is my symbol for the ideal diode. A diode which just conducts in one direction without any resistance and does not conduct in the other direction at all. So here, this final circuit is very easy to analyze. Here, the current will flow only when the voltage Vi exceeds V gamma, otherwise there will be no current. And when Vi is bigger than V gamma, the current is very simple. The current is simply Vi minus V gamma, the voltage difference, that has to be dropped somewhere. And it can only be dropped across the series combination Rd plus Rl, because remember, the forward bias diode does not have a voltage drop across it if it's ideal, which the red one here is. 
So current is simply V i minus V gamma divided by the total resistance. So the voltage, the output voltage, which is the voltage across R L, is simply R L times that. So V R is R L by R L plus R small r d V i minus V gamma. So to conclude, we have found out the answer to the question, what is the output voltage? As V i changes, the answer is simply this. If V i is bigger than V gamma, then V r is given by this expression. And V i is less than V gamma, is simply zero. Now, this is the, this is using the full diode equivalent circuit. AC resistance, cut in voltage, everything. As I said, typically R L, the load resistance will be kilo ohm order, small r d is a few ohms. So, you would usually be safely able to ignore the small r d compared to the capital R L in the denominator here, which means this fraction will be nearly 1. So, in that approximation, the next stage of approximation, V r is simply given by V i minus V gamma when V i is bigger than V gamma and is 0 when V i is less than V gamma. So, the, there will be no output voltage until the input voltage reaches the cutting voltage. After that, the output voltage will simply be a replica of the input voltage shifted down by the cutting voltage. This is pretty simple. <coughs> but if V i is much bigger than V gamma, typically, then you can make, a, make an even simpler approximation, which is this one, which is finally the ideal diode approximation. Then just forget about the R d and the V gamma battery. And then V i will simply be equal to V i if V i is positive, because when V i is positive, there will be current flowing in the circuit, no drop across the diode, and since there is nothing else at this level of the approximation, the entire voltage has to be dropped across R L. And obviously when V i is less than zero, the diode will not conduct and there will be no voltage drop across the resistance. So depending on how accurate you want your answers to be, also on how big your circuit parameters are, the different levels of approximation may be pretty appropriate. So finally, let me provide you with a result. The result is that of a numerical calculation done with a sinusoidal voltage source using typical parameter values for the diode. So what I did was essentially write down the diode equation, the Is e to the power Ev by eta kt minus 1 equation along with the KVL equation, Vs equals Vd plus IDRL, solved them numerically using a computer and found out the output voltage. I also found out the output voltage using this approximation, Vi minus V gamma. I could not ignore V gamma with respect to Vi here because we were using small values of the input voltage amplitude, around 2 volts or so. So here ignoring the cutting voltage completely would not be that great an idea. So let's present you with the results here. So here I plotted the input voltage in blue. This is a standard NumPy matplotlib matplot calculation of the kind that we did in the last semester. The orange curve here gives you the numerical result, whereas the green curve is the result from the effective diode circuit. So I'm pretty sure you will agree that uh, ignoring V gamma would not have been very good. That would have told you that the output is simply this blue curve until this point, then flat, then the blue curve. Of course, it would have told you that the output is rectified. It's only in one direction. But it would have missed the details of the output. The numerical result, of course, act is an exact result as long as the characteristic curve function is a exact descriptor of uh, what the diode behaves like. The numerical curve is the orange one, but as you may, you may realize, the green curve, the result from the effective diode circuit is actually pretty close to the numerical curve, except for the small region where the diode current is nearly zero. There's hardly much of a difference between the effective diode circuit and the numerical calculation. So, in the next lecture, we are going to take a look, deeper look at the diode rectifier circuit and try to see how we can improve
on its performance by making certain additions to the circuit. We will also take a look at other diode circuits. Most of the time we will be using the F equivalent diode circuit, the ideal diode in series with an RD and V gamma. In fact, sometimes we are just going to ignore V gamma and RD, just use the ideal diode approximation to understand what's going on. Notice that at any given stage, if we are not satisfied with how well our approximate model is performing, we can always go back and make it more precise by incorporating more elements. And if you want very high precision, there's always numerical calculation. Anyway, all that is for the next lecture. Bye for now.